Good morning. Welcome to another week of Journey with Christ. I'm your host, Mark Mitchell, preaching minister here at the Park Avenue Church of Christ in Charleston, West Virginia. And I'm joined, as always, by Steve Fox, our resident expert and a minister for f- over 50 years. How you doing today, buddy? I'm doing okay, and you? Oh, you know, hey. You ought to be rested. Both of us ought to be rested. We we cut our sermons in half. <laughs> the output is half what it would normally be yeah. in a two-week span. And if you notice, yesterday you got five responses. Five people got up and walked out. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm doing okay. I, I, I'm trying really, really hard to get myself in the right mood because our brothers and sisters in eastern Kentucky have just had two weeks of chaos and I mean, you might as well call it <coughs> hell because that's what it is. My daughter's been down there twice with a couple truckloads, a couple of her friends took truckloads down there and I've been pleasantly surprised that the churches, local churches got together here and did all kinds of stuff. You know, took clothes and clean supplies. I told Susie when we were talking about this last night, I said, can you imagine getting up in the morning? You don't have a, a roof over your head. You don't have any kind of a house. You don't have anything to eat. You got the clothes that you got on your back that you wore for the past two days. And you're trying to, in some way, encourage these people that that have ended up with nothing. Mm. I don't ever want to know what that feels like. And Stormy said, uh, when she got back the other day, she said, pictures don't do justice. You can't you can't describe it to anybody. It's just, um, and, I, and I'm not real sure every once in a while that what I believe about eschatology, but I watch something like that or I watch those nine kids get killed in Texas. And I say, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Lord, come quickly. Come quickly. I I, I know um, as part of our human nature, we like to assert blame on somebody for whatever is uh, befall upon someone whether it be floods, hurricanes, tornadoes, uh, diseases that ravage bodies. Uh, I mean, we like to lay it at somebody's feet because it actually helps us cope. Yeah. Um, And it's never ending. I think one of the hardest things as a, a believer in Jesus and God, first of all, is to come to realize that we actually live in a form of chaos. Mm -hmm. And uh, now, you could have many debates with many different people as to who created the chaos. Uh, My understanding of the Bible is that humans participated in creating the circumstances by which we live in along with Satan, who now, uh, because Adam and Eve decided they wanted to adhere to Satan, Satan got to make some choices. But it's still yet hard sometimes, as you and I talked about before we were started recording. We just want to know, well, God, why won't you step in and stop some if of this If we stuff? can see that, can't you see it? Yeah. <laughs> I heard a preacher in Ohio one time was talking about this guy that got up to the gates of heaven and Peter said, you're allowed to tell one story, one prominent story in your life Mm -hmm. and if we agree with it, we'll let you in. And the guy said, oh, that's that's easy. He said, that's that's an easy one. He said, I'm going to tell the story about the time I was in the Johnstown flood. And the the angel looked at him and said, now you got to remember, Noah's going to be in the audience. Yeah, yeah. So don't act as, don't act like it's so cool. That you... Yeah. Well, imagine uh, first century Christians who could tell the story of we get aggravated because we get mistreated 
they were burned in crosses, mm -hmm. uh, eaten by lions, yeah. stoned to death. Uh, any f varying form of cruelty you could name has been dished out on humanity long before we ever, you and I, ever stepped on this earth. And I find this very, very hard to believe. I'm just speaking for me, not for anybody else. But I find it hard to believe that when when somebody says, well, this is this is for your good. Mm. This is going to make you better on the other side. Well, can't God make me better on the other side without doing whatever He's doing? I mean, you, you lose people, you lose your job, you, you lose all your finances, you, you have somebody in your, in your household that's sick. All those things keep eating away at you, and after a while, it really deals with your faith. I know, and, and you know the sad part. Um, I interpret that particular scripture because I, I think it says, "I will make it be for your good." Mm -hmm. um, not that I'm not that I'm using this to make you better, but what Satan intends to harm you, I'm going to use to make you better. Um, now, that's my. There's a verse in the Pentateuch where Joseph says in Genesis to his brothers, you intended it for evil, God intended it for good. That's right. I get down on my knees every once in a while and read that verse over and over and over again. Because? I've seen it happen to me, mm -hmm. and I've seen it happen to other people at a much, much greater. Yeah. And the faith of Joseph, I mean, you talk about untreated unjustly. Oh, man. Sold by your own family into slavery. And the worst thing about him, he was always losing his coat. Yeah. <laughs> Every time he turned around, he had to get in the coat. But up, up. But um, well, well, the last thing I wanted to say about that is okay. if if that's the way it's going to happen, if that's the way eschatology progresses and it progresses itself through the providence of God, then maybe th we're here on this earth during this time and in the middle of all this mess. To help us understand what how absolutely wonderful heaven's going to be, because there's not going to be any of this stuff that we're dealing with now. And it, it also, is, I, th I think, also, Steve, is a reminder of the turmoil that uh, this world offers when Jesus, when God offers peace of another variation, uh, and I. Honestly, don't think you could say that we live in a world today that is literally says, I know it's on our money, but I never see anybody walking like in God they trust. So, mm -hmm. it, it's harder and harder to find. Yeah. Well, what we're going to study this morning in the two minutes we have left. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've been looking at the last couple of weeks, the responses that people may... You know, if you talk to somebody in our society today and you bring up the name Jesus or even God, um, you may have you may have a conversation that gets started, but you have no idea which direction it's going to go because the responses in today's society are so much different, so much different than you know each individual response is just totally different than the other one, mm -hmm. and you see all those in our society. So. We're going to look at some responses. These, these are all in Mark. We're going to look at responses that people made to Jesus because they all had different perspectives. And Mark's going to read the first one in Mark 3, 7 through 11. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the lake, and a large crowd from Galilee followed. When they heard about all he was doing, many people came to him from Judea, Jerusalem, Edema, and the regions across the Jordan and around Tyre and Sidon. Because of the crowd, he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him to keep the people from crowding him. For he had healed many, so those with diseases were pushing forward to touch him. Whenever the impure spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. Um, Be 12 too, please. But he gave them strict orders not to tell others about him. Okay. 
how, how would you summarize it? We're asking you to, as we read these paragraphs, to look at each paragraph by itself and what does Mark tell us about how the people responded to Jesus? And, uh, and he, we, we get a little taste of that in the first part of Mark when he talked about the, the rocky soil, the good soil, the thorns, the pathway. Um, there are all kinds of different responses that people can make. And certainly these people were making... Did you, did you see any responses in there? Well, <clears throat> uh, they were pushing toward him in such large... Uh, uh, presence mm -hmm. that all of them were pushing to the point where they were pushing him <laughs> off the land into the water and that's why he had the boat because he knew what was he saw what was happening and knew what was probably going to happen well ha haven't you ever preached a sermon when the the people tried to get you in a boat so they get you away from I've had him try to get me to put me someplace, but it never was a boat. It wasn't. Uh, no, and it never was because they wanted to get near me to touch me. Yeah, that's uh, true. So I could have told you that. Uh, they might have wanted to touch me and not the same way they were being. Lest they should crush him. Why are they trying to crush him? Because he, he has something they want. He has healing. He has something they've never seen. Yeah. Well, it's, it, 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 Mark actually, for he healed many, so though that those with diseases were pushing forward to touch him, they, like people in Kentucky today, had a problem, and they knew this man could fix it. Mm -hmm. They'd already seen he could fix it. They were very aware that he could fix it. So they were doing everything they could to get close to him. So he could fix their problem. And he did a good job of fixing it too. As you go through Mark, you see many different responses. One of them, one of them is, uh, like you said, he healed many. And so when he healed many, a lot of parents probably were taking their kids and bringing them over there. If I can just touch him, if, this, yeah. if my child can just touch him. And there are two things that Mark is telling us so far in this gospel. Jesus could multiply food and he could do miracles. Oh, yeah. Now, if you're going to run for governor of the state, and you could do those two things. You're going to have standing... You're, you, you're, you're, yeah. You're going to have crowds. Uh, you might even have uh, uh, riots of people trying to, to get, get near you. Yeah. And, of course, we have some responses with some impure spirits. Tell us about that. Well... It, the most amazing thing about that is, first of all, uh, did anybody recognize, first of all, do we know if they heard them say it? We know that we have Mark recording it. they heard the unclean spirit saying it? Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't know. It says, they even fell down before him and cried out, you are the son of God. But he gave them strict orders not to tell others about him. Uh, now, who's he giving the strict orders to? The Satan? spirits, the, the demons, I, or um, or the he, people who got or healed. The people who got healed. Maybe both. I don't know. It is ambiguous. It, it's not really. That's a good word, and I bet you have a plethora of those words. <laughs> it is I, ambiguous because you can't tell. To whom he's directing that sentence? No. And uh, uh, which gives us, uh, of course. Now we know later on we have an instance where he tells somebody he's healed not to tell anyone. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I've got a uh, a moment where an impure spirit he tells him. I know that Legion. Now Legion wants to go with him, but. He tells, he says, tell what God has done for you. Yeah. And, uh, of course, it's so amazing that when somebody comes back after the death of Jesus, they're all ready to commit to Jesus because of that man who was, uh, got, lost those legion, who lost all those impure spirits in him. And he strictly ordered them not to make him known. What I've heard people 
say to kind of figure this verse out, to clarify this verse is, it wasn't his time. You remember when he made, yep. made wine and his first miracle and he told his mo mother, it's not the time yet. Well, he, he actually makes that statement several times, yeah. you know, throughout the Gospels. So I guess he was the one, he and his father and the spirit were going to decide when the time was, but this wasn't it. No. And it was always clarifying to whoever he was around that what they may be asking for was legitimate, but it's not time, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. the, the, it's not the time to, to do this or to go much further with it. So, Okay, let's look at the second group, unless you got anything no, to, no, no. to say. <laughs> I'm, I'm still waiting for the first time okay. I say. <laughs> That's in Mark 3, and this next one is also in Mark 3 beginning with 13 through 19. You want me to read it? Go, or ahead. Read? Go ahead. Okay. Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed twelve that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. These are the twelve he appointed. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, to them he gave the name Boagenes, Boagenes, which means sons of thunder, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. It's an amazing chapter when you start thinking about his purpose for well what 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 do you think what would we say was his purpose for gathering 12 men like this well in in the context of what we're reading uh, these 12 was sort of like uh, first of all these are t the men that he wanted it's it says right in the very beginning there and he appointed him that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. And thirdly, to have authority to drive out demons. So there was three three things that these men were going to be. First of all, they were going to be with him, which meant they got special instruction that not all other disciples got. And and with that special instruction, that that way he might be able to send them out to preach what he once said. Uh, not that He's telling, giving them authority to make up the stuff as they go along, but they're going to repeat what they're learning from him. Can you imagine those, uh, well, let's call them vespers, every night when Jesus sat down with these 12 oh, men wow. and said, this is what I want you to say when you go out there. And some of them are probably, well, i got to write that down, or somebody, i got to stick that in my head. Well, I mean, This is not an easy assignment. You, you go out there and tell the people what I've been telling you. And think, I've often thought to myself, can you imagine the conversation and the discussions they had? And you talk about a while ago understanding some eschatology or just understanding some theology. Mm -hmm. The discussions they would have had, wow, would you like to have had, been a part on sure. any of those? And you gotta, you got to remember, this is square one. They hadn't heard any of this. Except, no. Because Jesus doesn't, not that it's not okay. Jesus doesn't really quote very many Old Testament passages that deal with this mission. So he's telling them right from square one, I'm going to teach you what I want you to say. I want you to learn that, and then I want you to go out among the people. And he's asking them to look for, remember the parable we studied, he's asking them to look for good soil. Yeah. Now, he picks 12. But one of them, you and I have discussed this before about the providence of God, one of them is going to be responsible for him dying mm -hmm. because he was greedy and wanted 30 pieces of silver. Yeah. Yep. I mean, he had... And Jesus knew that when he picked these 12. So, uh, yeah. That's what I wanted you to say. I wanted you to say, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I will for right now for you. Oh, okay. <laughs> 13. <laughs> He goes up on the mountain, he appoints these 12 apostles. The easiest way to remember it is, 
all the apostles were disciples, but not all the disciples were apostles. That's right. And so there are 12 men who are going to be with him day and night, sometimes 24 hours a day, before they end up in Jerusalem where he finally is crucified. Mm -hmm. He sent them out to preach. It doesn't say what, but obviously it's things that he taught them. And have authority to cast out demons. I can preach and I can do miracles. That came from the authority of Christ himself. Simon, whom he surnamed Peter. Now some of these in this list, some of them have two names or the son of somebody. Mm -hmm. And so after Mark gets done giving us that this list, and then the last verse is, and Judas Iscariot who betrayed him. It's a really nice list until you get to that. Yeah. One bad apple. Um, yeah. And... Uh, of course, now, we all know that every one of them is, has a, is a human, first of all. Yeah. Uh, Peter, for all his uh, nature of just, you know, he just... <laughs> Peter's the guy that, if you want to send somebody in wailing, s just swinging for the fences, <laughs> Peter's your guy. You know, because... And then, of course, John's a little more laid back. Uh, and I heard a guy say one time, that guy would fight at the drop of a hat. And, and he would, dropped, it was usually him that was dropping, dropping the hat. hat. That's right. And, of course, we know, like, Andrew, how, I mean, he was always in the background. Philip, uh, sort of that Matthew, the... <laughs> uh, he's a tax collector. Uh, well, he's a, <laughs> a Levite. Who, who lost his way? I mean, you know. Uh, and then you got Thomas, Doubter, uh, James, son of Alphaeus, who we don't hear a whole lot about, or Thaddeus. Uh, Simon the Zealot tells us enough about him that we need to know that here we have a political uh, individual because Zealot meant he was ready to draw, I mean, he was ready to get rid of the Romans. Right that then. was their purpose. That's Simon the Zealot, and then if you go back up here, one verse behind that, Matthew is a tax collector. You think they didn't have some for problems? For the other side. You, you think they had some arguments? I guarantee you Jesus was keeping an eye on You think on Republicans them. and Democrats are bad? <laughs> <laughs> they both carried knives all the time. Yes, like, they did. So, yeah. So, yeah, you have a... Uh, you have a... I'll use your word, a plethora of individuals here with varying degrees of background, uh, experience, and actually intelligence, too. Who Jesus is about to mold into jars of clay, as Paul would put it. Mm -hmm. And uh, These men are going to be a little bit different at the end of this three-year period. They're going to be real different. Of course, they probably weren't real happy sleeping outside at night or not having enough food. I don't think it bothered them as much as it would us because... It's probably not. Uh, they were used to... Most of them were used to sleeping on a boat. Well, I remember when I was a little kid, it was always exciting to sleep outside next to the barn. And I'd make it about an hour and, you know, you're laying on rocks and grass and weeds and... Not as fun as I thought it was going to be. So you go back in the house. Nope. Yeah. And those people had some deal, some things to deal with, and and they 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 sacrificed pretty much their entire, mm -hmm. their entire life to do what they're going to do. Well, you want me to go to the next verses? You can take the next one. Three twenty and twenty one. Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of, it, of him, for they said, He is out of his mind. <laughs> now, uh, this isn't the only time someone Jesus that think, somebody thinks Jesus is out of his mind. Uh, but it is a little bit more disconcerting when it's your family. It's your family. Who watched you grow up? Yeah, I don't guess they were in this, uh, you know, because I always I've heard the stories of where 
some people that like to make up that Jesus did all kinds of he already figured out he had the gift to heal and make things and you know yeah and uh, didn't anybody didn't his brothers or sisters see him do any of those I think it's isn't that in the apocrypha there are a couple stories about Jesus like when he was a little boy in his dad's wood shop he cuts his piece two before and he cut it wrong, so he just reached out and stretched it out a little bit more. So <laughs> there are stories like that. Yeah, so, but we have no uh, theology or no scriptures that we believe to be fully authentic and been vetted that now, say this, that. This is, this is evident. This is lit. I mean, it makes more sense with the understanding of hearing these verses. That anybody claiming to be a god or sent by God, he's plumb out of his mind. Mm -hmm. I don't care how many demons he takes out of somebody. It's not he's not uh, he's not the son of God. The Revised Standard softens it a little bit. It said the family said he's beside himself. Yeah, well, he's out of his mind. I think is a little more accurate. It's a, it's a more accurate statement uh, simply because that's what they thought. In fact, we're going to read the rest of the response that follows this, which is, you talk about doubling down on uh, condemnation of someone. Okay, if you're not out of your mind, there's one worse thing that they're going to lay at Jesus' feet. You're Satan. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So. Well, this, this is kind of tough because... As we noted in the paragraph before, these people are making a response. And I'm sure there were some people that were going, uh, Hey, have you ever heard John the Baptist preach? Let's go out and listen to him. Mm -hmm. They go out in the riverside, riverside and listen to him for a while. Next day, did you ever hear Jesus preach? Let's, let's go out and listen to him for a little bit. So they're getting things in their mind and they're trying to the best of their ability to decide, just like his family was doing. He's either the Messiah or he's playing crazy. Those, those are the two choices you got. You don't have this choice of, well, he was a wonderful teacher. No, he wasn't. If he was a wonderful teacher, he wouldn't have been lying about who he was. Right. Well, actually, it's uh, that's one of C.S. Lewis's premises in his book uh, that he says you come to there's there's too many too much evidence. Of the existence of Jesus, mm -hmm. so he was either telling the truth. Yeah, he does have a phrase. Um, he's telling the truth, or he's out of his mind. Uh, no, it's, it's out of his mind. Uh, liar, Lord, liar, Lord, lunatic. Yeah. So he's a Lord, liar, liar, or lunatic. Yeah. And Aren't you impressed that I at least know one thing about C.S. Lewis? Yeah, I mean, that was pretty good. Uh, and they, uh, those in the first century here, are still trying to sort out their, their decision about <laughs> is he a lot Lord, liar, or in uh, Lord, lunatic, or Satan? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sure there are a lot of people in our society that look at their brothers and sisters and say, you know, what happened to them? Because that's not how Mary is. That's not how John is. Mm -hmm. what happened? And so they they really got some doubts. Yes. Well, I'm going to go ahead and start reading verse 20. You, you read that. Go ahead. So Jesus called them over to him and began to speak to them in parables. Oh, wait. I'm supposed to read it. Start reading. In verse 22. And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, He is possessed by Beelzebub. By the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. So Jesus called them over to him and began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. 
Truly I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying he has an impure spirit. Mm -hmm. Wow. Talk about your verses that you can get uh, in and not maybe not come out for a month. Yeah. Uh, this is some of them. Well, this is one of those things, too. If, if you look at normal brothers and sisters who are with each other all the time, um, this goes even a little bit farther than that. I mean, it's not just we don't like him. Um, he, he's not nice to me. Not that kind of stuff. It's just we think he's crazy. Well, I'm surprised they didn't say to say to him, though he's our mother's favorite. <laughs> we, we, he's crazy. And he's just touched. By the way, he is the oldest. Yeah. I don't care what other churches say about Jesus not have any brothers and sisters. But Joseph had a family before Jesus yeah. married. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, we don't have evidence, but it's more likely that they Jesus is the oldest sibling that's correct and uh, you're right but you know the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem who says he's possessed they are definitely not lawyers that we would presume to be that exist today though as soon as I said that I thought to myself yeah lawyers we have today say stupid things too uh, Without it, without evidence, because normally, by definition of an of a person who really wants to be a good lawyer, they don't do anything without evidence. Mm -hmm. They have to have the facts. They have to have the information. In fact, we know that anybody who understands anything understands only by facts and truth. That's all you have. <coughs> and they make the biggest assumption a self. Uh, it elevates them and puts Jesus down, which is never truth. Mm -hmm. You know, that's just that's just idiotic. And this is one family talking about what they see in front of them. Yep. Whereas uh, sometimes, you know, like you said about lawyers, um, a little second grader said, "My dad is a lawyer." The girl said, honest? I said, no, just like the rest of them. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, when, I know we all know this, but when you need a lawyer... Yeah, a, I mean, when you need great, somebody there to... There was one time in my life I needed a lawyer, and it was absolutely great, soothing to have him there. And in the first, in the first hearing we had, he said to me, Steve, you know how you talk to everybody? And... You have to make a comment about every sentence? And I said, yeah. And he said, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so You're making my job harder if you do. Right away, buddy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Only one doing the talking in this room, Steve, is me. That's correct. And he did a good job of talking. Uh, well, and of course, Jesus, with their discussion of, or their reasoning that he must be uh, part of possessed by Beelzebub uh, is the fact Jesus says how is that possible you're not even logically laying forth any kind of reasonable mm -hmm. and uh, in other words I'm not the only one who thought they were idiots Jesus thought they were idiots too <laughs> because he said to them what you're saying makes no sense it's not logical it's not possible or how many times do I have to tell you this before you understand it? yeah yeah. And uh, and then he lays the coup de gras on him and says, "And oh, by the way, people who now, make is that better than what was the other word I learned this morning? <laughs> a plethora. Uh, uh, I said plethora. You said um, something really important. Ambiguous. Ambiguous. In." 24 when he says if a kingdom is divided against itself that kingdom cannot stand I guarantee you that was one of the things that he taught them to say to teach mm -hmm. when they went out into the wilderness to do that oh yeah but um, a lot of people say uh, 
You know who said that? Abraham Lincoln said that. Well, Abraham Lincoln said it, but he was quoting Jesus of Nazareth when he said That's it. That's right. Yeah. Absolutely. And a house is divided against itself. There's civil war right there. That house will not be able to stand. And I don't think our country is very far from that verse right now. Well, which... The house is divided against itself. In fact, I'll, verse 27 is what inevitably happens with a divided house. Mm -hmm. Someone's got to enter the strongman and tie them up mm -hmm. so they can do whatever they got to do. And sometimes they think by accusing people of them, they tie them up, which we have a, a version of that going on in our society. In verse 28, which we didn't read yet, um, he says, whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. What we're going to do is we're going to jump right over that paragraph, and uh, in about three weeks when you're prepared, you, you will be explaining that to us. Well, I'm glad we're not, I'm glad we're not going to cover it because we are at the end of all of our time. Oh, yeah, I, but we can start there next week. We can start there next week. I, I really think it, it is, as I said to you a while ago, uh, we could get lost in this particular section because there are three principles in there that are valid and that when they're built on one another they make a good understanding, uh, especially when we get to the last sentence where the blaspheming, mm -hmm. the eternal sin. Mm -hmm. Um, and we all need uh, we all need to for the most part think <laughs> as my dad used to say think before you speak Mark please because uh, you can say some stupid things <laughs> well you know just like Jesus told those uh, lawyers there you know you might want to think about this before you start speaking anymore because you're not doing real well with it um, we need as a, as a people to make sure that we understand um, you don't have to understand it perfectly but it sure helps to have a reasonable uh, understanding before you yeah. start telling somebody and you and I have talked about this at great length there is no problem with somebody saying I don't know I don't know what that means I don't understand it I don't know what it means maybe someday I will you know I think God is more impressed with our honesty when we say we don't believe it than to try to stumble through a definition or stumble through a parable and show your ignorance. That's probably... I didn't mean getting to at you when I said... <laughs> I say show your ignorance, I'm sorry. Uh, being as we started this thing with the confusion over the world that we live in and the floods and all that stuff, it's perfectly okay to not understand why and what's going on that's one of the th main reasons why faith was credited to Abraham he couldn't understand it either yeah. but he kept trusting God that God knew what he was doing and it would be okay and look at Afghanistan where all those people don't have anywhere to go a lot of, a lot of kids are starving and I, you got Iran and Iraq and all this stuff put together. And I know we can't help everybody. I know you can't take care of that individually one by one. But we can do what we can. That's right. Do what we can. And with Jesus teaching and preaching those things, he was preaching and teaching about the kingdom of God. And those of us who have... I was going to say falling into this trap, falling in love with this book. Um, that's what Jesus was trying to teach. That's right. Well, on that note, we are going to end this week, and we look forward to seeing you again next week when we will continue with our discussion here, and uh, Steve will come up with some really intelligent things to tell us about some of this stuff. I thought I was going to do that, but I wasn't sure. I'm glad, <laughs> I'm glad I listened to you there. <laughs> On behalf of Steve and I, God bless. And do not forget to pray for those in Kentucky, in, in Kentucky right now. Have a great day.